South Dakota's educational effort to raise awareness about the importance of soil health continues. The USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and I Grow South Dakota State University Extension for delivering these seminars with the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. Thanks for having me here today. We're going to talk a bit about our farm, some of the things we do, some of the things that uh, we need to be doing. So here's the Jamestown in Tweedy One, so it's not too far north. But it's quite a bit different than around here. I wish I was farming this far south. The cover of crops would grow quite a bit taller. So we're looking at about 4,000 acres of seeded cropland. We've been farmers since 1690. <coughs> We've been at this site since about 1930. <coughs> the recent run up in uh, these markets have narrowed our, our rotation. Regrettably, our farm is mostly rented, and our, a lot of our landlords, well, they like top dollar too. But we have spring wheat going back into our rotation this year, and rye. After all, if all you guys go and source rye seed for next year, well, you gotta buy it from somewhere, right? <laughs> it grows so well, you don't have to do anything, it just grows. You can spill it. You can seed it. You can nearly apply it. Just get it out there. <clears throat> so we have time to dry period. We'll go up quite a few years. Dry periods like many of you. That led uh, my father to look into this no till. And we slowly adopted it on our farm. Once we got a taste of the air seeders and the single disc openers, it was pretty much a slam dunk for us. We were a minimum tillage, and I think that was worse than full tillage. So we thought we were doing something, we were still destroying our soils. So we have 14 years of continuous no till. We do do a little bit of tillage, and that's if we get stuck or we remove a fence row. It's tough to, you don't want to have jumps in your field. So we have to level the soil a little bit when we do fence rows, expired tree rows. Recently, we've had 200 visitors. And that's in the last year and a half. So I don't think we're doing that great of a job. I see what I'm doing is inadequate and I need to do more. Basically, there's no end to how good you can build your soils and how much diversity you can put in there. So, one of our goals is just continue to build. Build as fast as we can our soil structures and our diversity. And basically, the recent run up in markets, everybody's pulling new equipment off the lots or pulling used tillage equipment out because they want more and they want it faster. That's no different in our area, in our region, or in our country, or in the world for that matter. So, all these visitors come out because there's not very many farms left to see this on. Every one of the visitors likes what they see. We get wet. We get really cold and wet. We get hot and dry. That's Ben, he worked for us for 15 years. And he had never seen tillage before. We broke up some CRP and he was my trusty grain cart guy and he says, we have to till this field, it's too rough. He said, we have to till this field, it's too rough. 
And he said, you have to till this field, it's too rough. You can't sit in the seat on that green card. He got really good at making his one lane through the field, missing all the bumps so we can have speed and, and still keep our combine going, harvesting corn. But he said, we either till this field or you get the grain card. <laughs> so I said, well, what do you think we should do? He said, we should till the field. We need to level it up. I said, well, at four years from now, we'll have a, a chance in our rotation where we'll have a lower residue. We can not have a covered crop one year. But we can do some leveling then. He said he won't be there that long. So I look at this rental property, think I won't have it very long anyway. And I said, well, do what you'd like. He tilled it. First till I just saw, he took a disc out there, smoothed out this CRP that we've been farming for five years without tilling. So he took a 26 year piece of ground that had been tilled in 26 years and he tilled it up. I didn't watch, I didn't deliver him fuel. He could not believe how much fuel he burned. And he said he's never doing tillage again. <laughs> the next year, he just saw the results and he said it's not worth it. Not worth it at all. <coughs> we can't go back. Is that better? So today we're going to talk about equipment, we're going to talk about cover crops, and we're going to talk about strip tail. We've been covering cover crops, like I said, for many years. We didn't know what we were doing when we were starting with. When we started this, there wasn't any data really to go by. We saw a little bit here and a little bit there. We had monocultures. It wasn't until up in this 08, 09, before we had any real mixes. We started mixing in this region, but we're just testing. A lot of testing. Just picking problem fields or problem spots. But that doesn't fix anything. Until we decided to do whole fields and these mixes, we started really seeing benefits. So in some of our dry years, we seeded, it was too dry to seed, but it was early enough in the year, we just seeded anyway, it's going to rain sooner or later, right? If not, the seed doesn't do anything good in the shed. <coughs> Stuff really grows. I think it's great for diversity. My kids think it's great because it's fun. And it's stuff you don't see every day. My wife thinks it's great. She doesn't have to go to the grocery store. So she feeds us that stuff. <laughs> but it's all results of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Our early years in no-till, it was great, we had all this residue, our grounds protected. But what do you do? What do you do when you have sterile soils? All this fallow here, you build yourself a problem. But you have to maintain 100% residue cover. Without that residue cover, well, you can see from Ray's presentation that the whole system falls apart. And just having residue cover isn't enough. These roots are the <coughs> most important thing that we as farmers can do for our soil. Let's put them there, keep them there, and give them diversity. Mobile nutrients. The EPA the Obama administration 
Who here is afraid of that rule that they're trying to put through? 96% of our farm touches and drain that touches the James River. My wife grew up in Maryland, Upper Chesapeake Bay. We were recently there, we were there last week, and I spent some time with her uncle who farms, and he was going to a farm meeting like this. <coughs> yeah, I want to go. I don't want to sit around. So I went with him, and we found a room full of farmers who looked just like us. USDA personnel, NRCS personnel, the local agronomists talking. Not one of them talked about best management practices. Every speech, every presentation was on regulation, how to fill out the forms, what you can't do no longer. Not one thing was on best management practices. They're using that as a model to regulate hypoxia in the Gulf. They're going to take away every tool we have until we change our ways. We can do it the way we need to, the way it fits for our farm. We can do it now. Ray's map about that degraded soils across the world. The big red streak to the northern plains. I thought we had pretty good soil. What's it going to be like in 100 years when we get done building it for our next generations? Well, we got to start now. We can't wait. If the government is going to tell us how to build the soil, how is that going to work out? <laughs> We'll do that. I'm sure it won't be as complicated as a new farm bill. <laughs> Precipitation timing. That's a real fun one. We started seeding corn this year on the 17th of May. Our rye cover crop was an inch tall. <coughs> It rained every three to four days. There's a hundred acres I never got to with the corn planter or the soybean planter. But with our forecasting and weather, we can see a wet spring coming. Our most fragile soils, I was on, out on March 30th. I loaded the drill on March 29th and I seeded a cover crop on March 30th. So a whole busload of French people had came out to visit us, and I had this great place to take them to because of a huge failure on my part to see the crop, right? But we stood in rye this tall, and right about this tall was the turnip radishes. Actually, the radishes didn't grow. There was, I don't think they liked sulfentrazone. But the turnips went through that. So having a mix out there, that's important. What doesn't work, you got something else there. So we still had a brassica. Our peas, the entire group, all the eight about an acre of peas. <laughs> the tiny was good. They were a little bit too crunchy. They weren't as sweet as they should be, but they were still delicious. I think more peas were eaten than cookies. <laughs> and the sunflowers were just ready to bloom. So having that, having that out there really saved the day. And that, that, that piece of sandy soil, it had life in it for a whole year. All summer long, the regrowth, we got our fall cover again. It's a winter annual, we get our spring cover. That spring fallow period, that's my favorite thing. My favorite cover crop comes up on its own when the soil is ready.
That's winter wheat. You can see the nitrogen starvation. There's more here, less there. Those brassicas overwintered. It's pretty tall. That's a great place to be seeing your crops. Over here you've got weeds. Over here you've got competition. We're trying different mixes, different type of cover crops. You can see in the background of this winter wheat only. But winter wheat's kind of slow, not much roots. We got into winter triticale. That was much more aggressive. We really like that. If I really like that, I figured, well, how much would I like cereal around? That's more aggressive yet. More roots. We're going after those roots. Chemical residues, using long residuals. That's great for crop production, but <coughs> how do we tailor that just to allow our cover crops? Well, here we're just fighting with ourselves again. If we have a appropriate system, we can get by with all the chemicals. If we can incorporate these rollers on this rye across a broad acreage, then we can have, we don't have to take the time to test to see what's going to grow. There's an area of veg on our farm, cow peas. I test everything in the garden. We start out in the garden because we walk by that every day, so we can inspect it every day. 100% residue cover. <clears throat> when we've seen soybeans under our rye, you can see how much residue is in between a row. It's not much. Our biology is switched on, and it's consuming everything we give it, mostly because we're not giving it enough. The more I give it, the more biology is there, the better everything is. So where is the limit? the amount of sunlight and the amount of growing days we get per year. Or is it? What happens in the wintertime when you're all cow hunting in February and you think, well, what's happening in my soil? Your buddies are telling you, hey, come on, what are you waiting for? I say, come back and look at this. So I move the, we move the uh, residue away in February and you see earthworms dive out of the, it's cold. They, go back in their hole, just like in the summer. But the earthworms are up feeding in February. So I'm asking myself, how do I achieve that on every acre? So we're working on that. We like to see it early, where there's not a cover crop. We don't want any bare soil in the spring rains. Here we're seeding peas for the crop. Seeding early, it starts in my garden as well. Here's this March 30th this year, seeding that dry cover crop. That residue wouldn't have made it to July. And then we'd be having blowing soils. We seed late in the year. We got a rental contract uh, at the end of October, a whole section. Four soils, very degraded. Well, I didn't use up all the rye in the truck or the drill. And I had to drop by there on the way home anyway, so we run the drill out. <laughs> Having a living root in the spring, your ecosystem starts up quicker. You have a diversity, so we're not going to plant that crop, right? If we were, we would have to go back out there. Here we're seeing the fennel beans in the rain. Up in the hills, there's a lot of animals living up there that like to dig up the soil. So that's where the that's where the mud on tires come from. Whenever you go over a little mound, 
there's enough mountains in that field that that living cover crop really never gets the tires all the way clean. We don't like to go out into our fields at all, but we're farmers, so we have to do a little bit, right? So we got to see the crop and harvest the crop. But we do it with as minimal passes as we can. The nutrients are cycling year round, even in February, because I'm pretty sure those earthworms got to poop too. So we're cycling nutrients all year round. The mobile nutrients are always mobile. Gerba cut stubble is awesome. Anybody have stripper heads? Raise your hand. I love South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple in North Dakota too. Those 1800 pound pinto beans seeded in the rain into a winter wheat cover crop. Here's a winter wheat cover crop. We had plenty of delays uh, that year, so I was a little surprised. I'd been seeding soybean ground and corn ground with soybeans, and then I got into pinto beans and I pull into this field that's out of the way so I don't see it every day. And I really thought I made a mistake by pulling in. There was a lot of winter wheat out there. That drill is in the area, it's not in the ground, so you know how tall the SDX is before we put it in the ground. So do I seed or not? That's free. Do I put a little bit put out a little bit of nitrogen? to make sure I fill those kernels. So either way, I'm going to put the sprayer out there, nitrogen or to kill it off. So we're doing math. We ended up seeding. Turned out good. There was a good price on pinnel beans that year. No fertilizer. Some chemicals are still addicted. That's a pretty good deal. <coughs> so we started no tone before no tone was cool. Before we realized that these aren't very fun to work on. And before we knew about cover crops. And this was so much better than minimum tillage. We really thought we had it. And stopping that erosion immediately and was a really good deal. That 100% residue cover that we achieved right away. That's really it. Do not let your soil see the sun. No bare soil. That's the goal. Sometimes we don't get enough sun. And this is a corn on corn crop that weighed about 36 pounds. You can't even sell that. We're not going to get rid of it. We're not going to till it under. If you can go out there the disc, you might as well have an air cart behind your disc, right? So here's our 40 foot disc, disc and on our corn and then make it. So corn on corn makes a lot of, a lot of residue. I pulled in here in the evening and I had about an hour run time, so I thought, well, this is so much residue, I better sit my drill a little deeper, make sure I get my seed in the ground. So I was seeding at about an inch and I wanted to maintain that inch. You can see the next morning, when the tractor was warming up, I was out checking how I was doing, see what adjustments I need to make for this field. And I had it at two inches. 
So I put it back to the same settings I had when I pulled in the two. Stripper cuts double, sticks around. Just long enough to get past your legumes to get your next high carbon crop. If we had platform cut stubble, we'd have bare soils and we'd have eroded. So this was spring wheat, followed by a cover crop, followed by pinot beans. On one side of the field, the soybeans on this side. NDSU thinks that's real neat, and they wanted to test it, and I'm always on their case about where are you going to find these no-till studies? Where are you doing these no-till studies? I've been involved with the research stations and <coughs> through the 90s and early to late 2000s, their no-till studies were on one-year no-till. They just stopped tilling the soil for one year and did these studies. They've since changed their game, and we're getting good research now. But when you go out in the country, where do you find long-term no-tillage? In our area, it's pretty far and few between. The equipment sales are, we have really good equipment sales. <laughs> so they were out, they got their weather stations and they measured well, everything under the sun. You don't want to get those caught in your cornet. <laughs> So one of the things they're doing is measuring, like I claim that our strip of cut stubble, the soils underneath of it are warmer and drier in the spring. That's pretty unbelievable in our area. Well, they're able to show what's going on. And here's the air temperature. And here's the three, three residue studies. So we took our stripper head out, harvested our entire field. He'd come out the next day with his equipment, and I'd brought down a platform there. And we cut, I think we cut at, it's at 18 inches, a couple passes with that, and then we cut, we shaved the ground. So we had all, all the material run through the combine, just like we're using a platform. We compared it with the strip of cut stubble, and he's taking temperatures. That's, those strips are the only part of the field that didn't get cover ground. So, Here's zero degrees. Here's 30 degrees. So out here in February, it gets cold again. My stripper cut stubble is above freezing. It's 18 inches, still above freezing. And the shut this stuff that's shaved is 31 degrees. And up here is 32.6. You can use a platform head one or two years, it's fine. You still have your soils covered, you still have your biology. But taking a snapshot in one year, if this was, if I used a, if I used a platform head every year, I wouldn't have the biology I have. I wouldn't have the soil cover that I need. <coughs> I'm not kneeling down, by the way. <laughs> so our corn really likes the residue. It really likes to grow. It really likes the biodiversity of the soil. It really likes the exchange capacity that we get with the diversity. With our soil structures, by keeping the soil covered, the corn just goes to town. That's a 79-day corn. Everyone in the area goes 85 to 91 day corn. We grow a shorter day. And we don't suffer yield wise. We gotta get out there and look with a shovel. You know, if you don't have a shovel, you can still look. There's 17 eggs and there's 17 babies. Those are lady beetles, ladybugs before they earn their wings, right? There's critters everywhere. <coughs> We're scouting for acres. <coughs> you see, that one's about to be lunch. The kids like scouting too. 
It's like a maze. I haven't lost any yet. <laughs> but I walk slower when we get into the corn. They love what we find in our soils. <laughs> Has everybody heard that? Our healthy soils? Diversity. We don't run cattle on our on our ground. Fencing and water supply is our limiting factor. A lot of rented ground. Kind of a hang-up. Doesn't mean we don't need that to happen on our farms. That's not strip till. That's not a till oil plant. You can see all the advertisements. That's our residue. A lot of times it's two to three inches thick. The fresh residue is up on top. There's a fine duff layer at the soil surface. We don't move any soil. You take the edges of those and you peel them back. If you can feel this, if you get down to the bare soil, you feel a bump, you know, it start pulling your residue matter. So we cannot move any soil. Otherwise we get erosion, or we have problems and we can't get a planter to work. We need the residue there. No cover crop, we need weeds. <coughs> One pass, we don't want anything else driving around in our fields, but it's tough to get in the stand of corn for the interplane. So we gotta go out there once. We put all our nitrogen, all our fertilizer, the whole load down. If we get in conditions where we're going to have a lot of corn, then we can go out with a sprayer and apply liquid nitrogen if needed. I'd like to get in the habit of doing that every year regardless. But if the corn plant's not going to catch it, I'm not doing any good. So when we can get our inner planter up and running, we can apply nitrogen every year, we can build our soils. That much quicker. Soil structure, aggregation. Some of those years get pretty wet. You can see our cover crop. <coughs> this field is a uh, rental piece I picked up. I've been farming it three years. We don't go through the water there, it's not going to happen. So then we have to drive all around and make all this extra compaction. That's not soil. That dark stuff, that's our residue from two, three years ago. That <coughs> dust that's on top of the soil. The larger residue protects it, keeps it there. The smaller bugs can't take a bite of big pieces of residue. There's no cover crop. <coughs> you see what the neighbors got going. No shortage of water out here. There's a lot of subsurface water. In fact, about two and a half feet down year round is the water table. So you have to really work it up and you prevent plant every two to three years. Or you have aggregation, living roots, and a sub-irrigated corn crop. That's working real good for us. Look how clean this water is. Look how clean the tires are. What's the value of aggregation in your soil? How well does that work? Because you don't see a cover crop on here. This is going to go away. 
we're not going to do that much longer unless we change what we're doing. I'm happy with the job we're doing. We've gained recognition for it, but we're still wrecking it. This is not enough. I need to do more. This was alfalfa for 18 years, and this has been in the cropping system now for six years. <coughs> when I first took alfalfa out in a no-till system, maybe two, three years, we were back to back to having one. So we're making progress. But there's still no cattle out here. <coughs> we don't have biodiversity in our the above ground animals. It doesn't always work that good. Some of our best some of our best soils. You saw the soybeans growing in the stripicum stubble. That was taken right about here. <coughs> you know, a year before this. So that's stuck. See the mud on the tires? There's an end. See how deep we see? <coughs> There's a subsurface water problem and some sand, different material. So I actually, it was so wet, I couldn't lift the planter out of the ground. But it was May, near the end of May. We like to have a little bit of corn to harvest. I had seen it 60 acres without pulling a planter out of the ground. Get to the end of the field, and go <coughs> two, three rounds over, and hit the auto steer, and you go back up, and then two, three rounds over, and just kind of work the field out. But my biggest mistake was when I ran out of fertilizer, I went up, loaded back up. I didn't fill it all the way up because it was pretty soft. I pulled into the field with a half a load, I put a three-quarter load in, and my soil didn't like it. It was much too wet, frost still coming out of the ground, subsurface water and sand. There's no structure down there because there's always water there. There's no air. So we, there's some spots in our field that need addressing, but it's tough to tile on rented ground too. So you see, that's liquid sand and clay. Real nice mixture. The water moves through pretty well. And it actually squirted. The weight of the cart just made it squirt up. See the bottom of the tires? It really is dead. But we're stuck. Look at the slime and the slop in the hole. Look at the aggregation. I carry that cable with me, it comes in handy from time to time. We got spots like this everywhere. Look at that, this squirted right off. You can see my abandoned fertilizer. <coughs> Look at the aggregation. How many people get stuck and still have clean boots when they're done, right? Well, rough years like that, it's just abandoned the, the heavy weight. And, Sometimes a lightweight wins a fight, right? That pulled right off, by the way. It was no big deal. Sometimes we try to farm where we're not supposed to be. You see the cattails? I love stuck pictures. Who likes stuck pictures? <laughs> <laughs> They're so funny. Like, look at what we did. So I just filled my hair guys in a sprayer, I just filled them up. He decides that after this four inch rain, look at the mud all over everything. It's not there. Four inches of rain, we're applying nitrogen on our, on our corn. We didn't get it all done before the rain. And we forget a lot of times when we fill up our tank that it gets pretty heavy. So we're out here with our skinny tires on and he's crossing a drainage ditch. He says, oh gosh, that's right, I'm heavy. But he had his speed up already. He pulls it, pulls it back and just parks it right in the ditch. Well, then he couldn't come out. So he just kind of worked it down. It wasn't a big deal. But look at aggregation. That's not slime, that's not soup. There's water running out of the soil. 
This is an erosion ditch from the tillage days. We've got that filled in now and it hasn't washed back out. We're targeting our problem areas and we're fixing them. He thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> Here's our neighbors. That same year, we had a really problem year, 2011. <coughs> This fella was no-tilling before me. He uses a Concord. He's since bought a disc drill. He's doing more no-tilling. But he's, in 2011, he was still using his Concord for his corn to put his fertilizer out. That just doesn't work. You just lose all your aggregation. One pass wrecks everything you've built. Stay out of the field. Many of you will ask how we accomplish these things. Exapta, everybody gets the Exapta folder. Every other little sales brochure. There's more pages of knowledge than there is of products. You can't buy your way into success. You have to do the things right. So we cut, spread, insert our seed, ferment, and make sure we close our trench. This works the same across the United States. This is tilling 7% of my corn ground. It drives me crazy. If I can get my soils better, I can go back to it not aggressive closing wells. I set these about three inches over. At two and a half, certain years, you can get a little bit of urea burn. Don't know if it's urea or, or the, <coughs> the other stuff in urea that's doing the harm, but at three inches, we don't have any problems. Dry years, wet years. We put down between 400 and 600 pounds of fertilizer with this We had to redesign our fertilizer openers because <clears throat> that little Dutch thing you weld on the back knees, I'm sure there's got to be at least two guys in the room that have tried that. You're limited to 200, 220. That's all you can get down for fertilizer. So then you're at multiple passes. You can't have multiple passes because then you're out wrecking your soil. Burn up fuel. So we've got this tubing, and the opening has got more surface area than, than that tube. That's an inch and three quarter exhaust pipe. I have about 6,000 acres of corn fertilizer through those tubes. And they're not worn out yet. I think my days are numbered. But that is also going to seem to hold up. We can have our full air pressure on that cart and not blow anything out of the trench. Everything's inserted. There's a pressure drop in here and it just kind of pours out. So that works pretty well. So I got two rows. I had an intense phone conversation going, I didn't want to stop. So I see it across the field, two rows not working. And you can see not much for weeds. We still have residue cover. Not much left. You can see where our row cleaners went. Here and here. Everybody get a successful farming magazine? Did you read it yet? Just come, what, two days ago? For us. Compaction. I have tires, that's the new 
newer style radials. So NDSU and John Nowatsky are out a year before the Grove track that they're selling now, that really nice shiny tractor with the skinny tracks. And they say they need area to do compaction study on. They want to look at compaction planting corn. And they want to look at the rows that are in between the tires and the rows that are, don't have tires around them and look at the difference. Well, I thought that was great, right? Everybody wants different, some, something different on their planter and they're seeing less yield right behind the tractor than on the, on the outside of the loops. So they're gonna measure this, I thought that was great. Well, a year into it, I find out who's funding the research and I thought, well, I better watch these guys. They're doing unbiased research not this, not this research project. I'm talking about the one that's on our farm with NDSU. They're measuring soil compaction on five different soil types across our field. So they're out doing three replications. You should see them on a pin flames in their field. That's really something. They took tire pressures. And on our planter, I have those metric tires on our tractor. Those things are running about eight pounds, and I'm seeding corn into that. So they're all excited that now they have this tractor that it's not actually going between the rows, it should be the most compacted row. So they're testing the most compacted row, which my tractor drives over top of, my planter drives on each side of it. There's two rows like this, on each side of the center of the planter. So they're, drive, they're, they're measuring these rows, after the planter goes by, my air cart drives right between them. I don't think you can get more compaction in the spring. They're finding zero. They're finding little to no difference across all five soil types on our, on our ground. They started out with this project and they said, we'd like to bring out three tractors and just switch them out on your planter so we can test the difference between these tractors. And one of those road tracks was one of them. So, I read this two days ago, and I thought, huh. I knew I liked those metrics for a reason. Those big tires are key. But if you drive across a field every square inch every year, three or four times, your big tires are you're still causing compaction. The best thing you can do is stay out of there. There's no reason to be out there. Our neighbors are doing six to seven passes before they see. There's no reason for any of that. So read the article. <coughs> this is a John out area. And it dries out a little bit later to sell cracks. We have shrink swell clays. The soil fixes itself. Red River Valley, Fargo Station, they compacted the soil the best they can. We know how to compact soil, right? People, we know how to do this. So they compact Red River Valley soil in the fall. They come out in the spring and they find zero compaction. Read that study, look it up on your Google. NDSU compaction, there's a bunch of them. Find through, find, go through there until you find that one and read it. The soil fixes itself and it does it pretty quick. If you stay off the soil, within a couple of years, most of your compaction is gone. A couple more years, the rest of it's fixed. Getting wet and drying out is what does it. It's not freeze thaws. Freeze thaws do a little tiny, tiny, tiny bit. Drying out. Anybody go to Big Iron? Ever drop your keys on a dryer? You're not going to get them back. You got two inch wide cracks into three inch wide cracks. Your keys are gone. You're walking home. The shrink soil clays are saving drinks. You go to the East Coast, they don't have shrink soil.
We do zone management. We're starting to not care so much about that because, well, what we're finding is, as the soil is taking care of our needs more and more every year, we have to do less and less, which is great. We like that. But we like to measure things. So on on our zones, here's what we started with in the soil test. This is what we applied. Here's what we have left over. So just a quick, easy use efficiency without taking the soil's contribution, contribution into effect. You can see the healthier soils are more efficient. These are all the same soil type. Why aren't these soils doing this? These are more eroded. So let's talk about strip tip. Any strip chillers in the group? I think this is strip till. So NDSU, they want to compare strip till and no till and tillage. So they, there's not too much long term no tillage in the area. So they come out and say we have to do this, so reluctantly, we let them out here. They didn't help us pick our rocks, by the way. <laughs> but I said no to the tillage. They said, well, that's fine. They're going to do, the soybean growers are paying for this. They want to do soybeans on strip till. Because, of course, strip till is great for corn, right? They assume. But, you can also use it as soybeans. There's benefits to everything, right? Well, they didn't find any benefits. It sure was fun. It was a nice day to be out there. <laughs> 30 inch rows from the front of my four wheeler to the back of the four wheeler on the row right next to it. I wasn't driving on these rows. I don't want to mess up their dad. So, two 30 inch rows, that's what I got for the length of my four wheeler. Should we really do, be doing more erosion? What are we going to find in our soils when we erode another inch or two off? <laughs> well, here's a little preview. Some people like strip till because of the deep tillage. So we do some deep tillage too, but it doesn't work for us either. There's some of the things down there you don't want to mess with. Let your roots do the work. They're afraid. That's what we're after. I don't want to have these three all in the office filling out government forms for their farm. What I saw last week in Maryland, that's what it takes. If you want to be a farmer, you better have a dedicated person for your paperwork. Small farms. Do we have any questions today? It's it goes about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half. With the residue cover, it's more than enough. We used to put it down to four inches, and that was just a nightmare. We created all kinds of problems. Can you repeat the question? Oh, the question was, how deep was I banding the fertilizer on my corn planter? Well, that, many of you guys have that same opener on your planter. You know, there's really only two settings. You got two positions for the depth, and you got two positions for the spring. So we have it in the light spring position and the light depth, and it's it goes in all the time. The soil with our 
100% residue cover. That soil is just beautiful to see it in. If we spread too much soil away, or too much residue away, then it all melts up. You know, not on most of the field, but there's a couple spots, they, wreck, they sure wreck the day. But if we keep our row cleaners out of the ground, and we leave part of that residue there, you can see all the inseed, the rain, and the corn plant. I didn't mud up any wheels this year. It was a wet year. What kind of road cleaner have you got? Those are, came on a planter. It's a Don. They move rocks, big ones. Well, what kind of row cleaners are on the planter? Now, are they floating ones? Nope, they're rigid. <laughs> The, the depth control is set by the gauge wheels on a planter. They do a really good job. They're like kind of a walking tandem deal. They follow the ground real well. They hold that row unit just right. It's a great place to have your row cleaner. You can eliminate, with that weight of the, all that stuff hanging on your row unit, you don't need as much spring pressure. It's constant. It's not variable like springs. And the, and the depth is set. It's constant. It takes about two days to get them. Every year, it takes about two days to do that, just to get it just right. I don't know why year to year it's different. I think somebody comes out at night and adjusts my adjusters. Now every year I play with them until they're just right, and you know most of the, most of it I think contributes to just the different conditions. A little bit of different conditions every year. I just need them quarter turn here and there. How are you choosing your varieties? How am I choosing varieties? It's pretty easy. You get down to 79, 80 day corn. There's only a couple that really <laughs> <laughs> plant those ones. When new ones come out, don't buy them right away. What percent of your farm do you want crappy variety? No, they're, they're really come a long way. You know, try them out. I have, uh, you know, we do our variety test plot every year. Everybody says, oh, it's a new seed. It's a great new seed. You're really going to like it. Okay? I'll take four bags. Oh, and we only have it in totes. I'll buy me a different variety then. You know, we're going to test it first. And I think that if we're growing 120 day hybrids and you look at the seed books, I think that you got to test them all on your farm too. Everybody does things a little bit different. Have you tried any high calcium lime on your soil? Um, <laughs> there's some. There's much more. I swear to that part. Actually, in our in our soils, are just loaded with lime. You dig down a little bit, there's more lime. I, mean, I don't think I can apply the fertilizer in five generations to burn that up. Calcium is not a problem in South Carolina. We got plenty of calcium, plenty of magnesium, plenty of pH. But having that biology and there's a buffer makes that stuff not be such a problem. Now I do have, with the zone management, I have found areas. 5.6 under pH, and areas where we could use a little bit more lime, a little more calcium. Some of those balances are different. Um, with variable rate management, you know, it's it's achievable to get a couple truckloads of lime and put them where you need them. But for the most part, plenty of lime. Let the earthworms work. You know, they bring up to the top what you need. Go ahead. I was just what's driving the earlier day hybrids. I mean, why you just bigger planting window and less drying and stuff. They seem to work better. Our soils don't go to 90 degrees right away. They don't start killing biology the first every day it sunshines. It, it's more moderate. We lose we lose some growing green units in May. We gain, everything we lose, we gain back in June, July, August, when it's hot. 
Our soils are cool. They're just what they need to be. They're perfect. And the corn responds to that. But when we lose degree units in the earth in the spring, you can't make that back up. Some years we get enough sunlight to bring it back, but it's not worth betting on. Everybody's seen through your corn. When they take crop insurance away, then what are you gonna do? I think we're gonna go down another five growing degree days probably. But <coughs> these uh, 90 day varieties, some of them really dried on well and they respond. I, I had to go up to 94 days in my test plot and some of those are just fine. But I don't like seeing those long day varieties. I've already heard that question too. <coughs> well, why would I choose the earlier day varieties is the question. We shouldn't grow a lot of corn where I'm from. Um, how much time do we have? Yeah. Any other imperative questions? You can grab me if I'll be here until they close down here. Thank you.